Now if you'd please join with me responsively for our call to worship, and of course it will be shown on the screen as well as can be found printed in your bulletin. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 to 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Their feet shall walk upon those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. <coughs> Let us now go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. And Lord, it is you, our God, and you deserve all glory, all honor, and all praise. Thank you for gathering us here this morning for this service. And we call upon you to guide this service. Allow our Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, to be within our midst as we start this service. May you be glorified from the beginning right on through to the end. And please, Lord, give us peace that we be able to listen to you. And now let us join our voices and pray that prayer that Jesus taught our disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us join our voices together in song for our hymn of praise. And of course, it'll be on the screen as well as can be found in our hymnals on page 122. And all that are able, let us please rise and stand together as we sing, O God, our help in ages past.
prayer of confession. Lord, we confess the sins of the nations. We want what we want when we want it. And we become frustrated and angry if we have to wait. Forgive our arrogance in believing that we know better than you and have a better sense of timing. Teach us how to wait on you. For Jesus' sake, amen. And now let us confess our personal sins by It's a joy, as always, to be with you this morning. And when we got up, like you, I thought, man, that is, that is cool outside there. Even though we covered uh, all our plants and flowers and, and that. 
But I said, so long as I don't see those white flurries in the sky, I'm okay. Let's come before our Lord again in a word of prayer. Let's pray. O Lord, who created the earth and all therein, may we, your children, come in prayer before your throne of grace this morning. And may we come, Father, in a spirit of awe and adoration. Help us, O God, to approach your throne also in a spirit of humility, realizing how much we depend upon you. As our Heavenly Father, you have created us. You have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and you daily sustain us through the faithful presence of your Holy Spirit. You, O Lord, are one God, reaching out to us through the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We come, Father, to thank you for the blessings that you continually bestow upon us. Sometimes, Lord, those blessings come in miraculous ways, and, and we are in awe of your goodness. Perhaps an operation was successful. Maybe a job effort proved to be successful as well. Maybe a family member, a friend, has been blessed. How wonderful it is to be able to say the simple words, thank you, Lord. Father, there are times, though, when your blessings come to us, but not in so miraculous a manner. And as a result, we have become accustomed to them. And we neglect, though, to say thank you. Sometimes, oh God, we become so caught up in the things of this world that we forget to give praise for the spiritual blessings, blessings of forgiveness, restoration, encouragement, the assurance of your presence in the world around us, and the knowledge of our promised status in the world yet to come. Father God, may our gratitude and praise be evident not just in our words, but in the lives that we lead from day to day. May it be evident in how we treat other people, especially those close to us, and those whom we count as fellow members of the faith. Father, hear our prayers this morning for any who are in need of a special blessing. Be with the one who in their world are facing what they see as a brick wall and perhaps it threatens their health, their well-being. Help them to confide in you, trust you, and move forward knowing that you will watch over them. Father God, bless any of our membership who are facing family concerns. And they may be wondering, perhaps, what more can we do to help our loved one? Be with them. Speak to them. Bless our seniors, O oh God. And we know that includes many of us who are here. But some are confined to their home. May they be aware that they are loved and they're remembered by their church family. Give guidance and direction to our elders who maintain an overview of our ministry here at Grace EPC. May it always be a ministry that honors you and is a blessing to your people. Gracious God, through the reading of your word and the proclamation thereof, may blessings come to your children. Help us as we hear your word read to feel the inward presence of the Holy Spirit carrying its meaning to our very heart. Give insight and direction to those, O oh God, who are serving on our building committee. 
as they seek to determine the feasibility of a new church gathering place. We know, Father, there will be hurdles to overcome. But if it is your will, we also know that a new building will become a reality. Lord, keep us all humble in our service. Here we pray. Hear, O oh God, all our prayers, and even those that remain now in our hearts, which we offer to you. Hear our prayers. In the name of Jesus Christ, who deeply loves and cares for all of his children, in his name we pray and may his will be done. Amen. Let us continue our worship of Almighty God as we present unto him our Sunday morning tithes and offerings. Father, we believe that with all of our hearts that people need the Lord, and we are so thankful that we needy people have found you, and really that you have found us. Lord, we pray for our church that we would be folks who introduce others to the faith that we have. We pray that these tithes and offerings would be used to further the gospel, both here and abroad, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Our confession of faith this morning is taken from the Westminster Confession, Chapter 11, Justification, Article Number 4. Let's read it together. From all eternity, God decreed the justification of the elect, and in the fullness of time, Christ died for their sins and rose again for their justification. Nevertheless, the elect are not justified until the Holy Spirit in due time does actually apply Christ to them. Good morning. Our scripture this morning is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. It says, Christ Jesus came to save sinners. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example of those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Be God. We're continuing this morning our sermon series on little books with big messages. We're going to actually look at several of the minor prophets. They're called minor prophets because their books are shorter than the major prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah. One of the minor prophets that I'm not going to talk about because his book was actually 11 chapters 
is the prophet Hosea. It's one of the great, great stories in Scripture that God instructs his prophet to marry a woman of adultery. I want to recommend a film that is based on the book of Hosea. Ann and I saw it this week. It's called Redeeming Love. And it's uh, based on a book by Francine Rivers. It's a modern day retelling of the story of Hosea. And I think it's a powerful film. It's a Christian film, but it is not for the faint of heart. Uh, because of the subject matter, and it's, a, it's at least a PG-13. So if you're expecting a squeaky clean movie, it's not going to be that. But it does have a powerful message, and one that I think, uh, I'm, I'm praying that unbelievers will go to this film and see the love, grace, and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, our minor prophet this morning is Habakkuk. We don't know a lot about him other than he wrote sometime in the early 600s, probably around 605 B.C. Now, Pastor Rick preached last week about Jonah, who was sent to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, a brutal militaristic nation, and at the message of Jonah, they repented, but it didn't last. About a hundred years later, the prophet Nahum writes that God is going to destroy the nation of Assyria, and he does. He uses another brutal nation, Babylon, also known as Chaldea, to defeat the Assyrians and the Egyptians. The Battle of Carchemish in 612 was one of the big battles of uh, early history. And the Babylonians became the great world power. Habakkuk is an unusual book because the other prophets speak to the nation. They speak to Israel, the northern kingdom, or Judah, the southern kingdom, but Habakkuk directs his message to God. It's a dialogue between the prophet and God. And Habakkuk is basically saying, Lord, how can you use these evil people, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, to punish Israel, who are your people. It's a very real dialogue. And it's all about waiting on the Lord. I don't often come up with clever sermon titles, but I think this morning's is good. Don't just do something, stand there. I think that's part of the message of Habakkuk. Listen, for this is the word of God. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you not make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise, so the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings, not their own. Then verses 12 and 13 in chapter 1. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors? and remains silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he. Now on to chapter 2. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower 
and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up, it is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. <clears throat> then on to chapter 3. The prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shingineoth. Nobody knows what that means. O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. And now the end of the book, verses 16 to 19. I hear and my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones, my legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. This is the word of the Lord. I believe that our instant society could learn a great deal from the book of Habakkuk about waiting on the Lord. We're a lot like Habakkuk. Oh Lord, how long will I cry for help? We want God to answer our prayers right away. Uh, I remember a wonderful experience. Ann and I were given a free trip to Hawaii for our 20th anniversary. And like most people who go to Hawaii, we attended a luau. Uh, if you've been to a luau, you know that they serve this fabulous uh, pork, uh, a huge pig that has been cooked underground. And it is possibly the best meat I've ever tasted. Well, during the luau, we asked sort of the master of the feast, how do you cook it so that it's so good? Um, and he says, well, we have a huge microwave under the ground. <laughs> Everybody, of course, laughed. Um, but we are a microwave society. We want things right now. We find it very difficult to wait uh, Joyce talked about TV, and that's our primary entertainment medium, and complex problems get solved in 60 minutes, or 43 minutes actually, including commercials, which also promise instant solutions. We see on the news condensed stories that attempt to be sound bites. Why? Because we don't have the patience to listen to the whole thing. There was a great preacher in the Middle Ages named St. John of the Cross, John Chrysostom. He had memorized much of the scripture. And after one of his sermons, a woman came up to him and said, uh, Pastor John, I would give the world to know the Bible like you do. And his response was, Madam, that's just what it takes, giving up the world to know scripture. There are no shortcuts to Christian maturity. It's daily Bible reading. It's prayer. It's committing to Christian fellowship and service. Rinse and repeat over and over again. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're often not ready for God's answers. Uh, in verse 5, God says, I'm doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. <clears throat> uh, 
Peter Marshall gives an example of a little boy who goes to his dad with a broken toy. And he says, Daddy, would you fix this toy for me? And his father says, yes, son, I will fix the toy. Well, the little boy goes away for a few minutes, but he comes back. Is it fixed yet? Son, I promised you I would fix the toy. Just be patient. The son keeps coming back over and over again. And finally, he takes the toy away and says, you wouldn't have fixed it anyhow. Marshall's example, of course, is our prayer life is often like that. We ask God for what we want, and then we demand that he answer us in his time. Well, God's timing is perfect, unlike ours. One of my favorite hymns is Lead Kindly Light. I would have chosen it as our final hymn, but it's not in our hymn book. Um, one of the lines reads like these, this, Keep thou my feet, I do not ask to see the distance seen, one step enough for me. The will of God is not a blueprint that comes down from heaven, but instead it's a way of traveling. We're to live in the will of God one step at a time and to trust his perfect timing. Jesus said, today's own troubles are enough for today. Live one day at a time. Don't be anxious about the future. Well, Habakkuk's second complaint, his first is, how long do I have to pray and you don't hear me? The second one is, <clears throat> Lord, how can you tolerate the treacherous. How can you use a nation like Babylon, which is so evil, to punish the people of God? <clears throat> you who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than himself? How can God use a more wicked nation to punish Judah? Well, God will eventually punish that wicked nation, but in his own time. It's a variation of the problem of evil that people raise over and over again. Lord, why? Why do good people suffer? Well, the answer to that is very simple. There are no good people. We suffer because it's part of the human condition. Habakkuk is bold. He says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he, God, will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Not only is Habakkuk speaking to God, complaining, but he's ready to answer God when God answers him. God loves holy boldness. I think of Abraham praying for Sodom and Gomorrah and his nephew Lot. Abraham is bargaining with the Lord. Abraham says, God, will you destroy this city if there are 50 righteous people? How about 45? Or how about 40? Or 30? Or 20? And finally he gets down to 10. Lord, will you destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there are 10 righteous people? And God, of course, had planned to save the only righteous people, Lot and his family, from the very beginning. But God loves when we deal familiarly with him. The Puritans had that expression. 
that God deals familiarly with the elect. He wants us to bring our complaints. He doesn't rebuke us for that. <clears throat> it's the difference between a stranger and your spouse. If you were to go to a stranger and say, why do you look so sad? That stranger would probably think, you know what? That's a rude thing to ask me. I don't know you. But when you say that to your spouse, the relationship requires it. I know that many wives wish their husbands would pick up on those cues and say, why do you look so sad? God loves it when we, in fact, deal familiarly with him. And God answers with patience and faith. Verse 3 and 4 in chapter 2 says, The vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It's not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. God's timing is perfect, even when it doesn't agree with ours. I remember talking with a woman who had been sexually abused when she was a child. The statistics on that, by the way, are incredibly discouraging. The number of women in our society who have been sexually abused. But she said this to me. She said, I wish I could have taken a pill and make it go away. But of course, there is no such pill. She had to go through years of counseling and a wonderfully supportive small group of uh, young women who enabled her to work through that. But she said, in the end, God worked it together for good in my life. And God used her to be able to minister to other women who had been abused. Verse 4, the righteous shall live by his faith, is of course the great message of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul holds on to that verse in the book of Romans to declare the doctrine of justification by faith alone, which was the doctrine of the Reformation, which changed history and changed our lives. Faith comes and justifies us simply by trusting in Christ. But that faith is ongoing. The righteous shall live by his faith. That woman who was abused lived by faith even when she felt unworthy, even when she felt as though she'd been sullied. The prophet Habakkuk gives us the amazing contrast between trusting and trembling. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble. He's being torn up inside but he's awaiting God's timing. A book that had an impact for me was Joyce Landorf's book, God's Waiting Room. Joyce talks about how at various times in our lives, we're in God's waiting room. I think of my mother-in-law's sister, Lois, Aunt Lois. For the last couple years, She's been, she was in God's waiting room, becoming more and more physically ill, uh, becoming less and less mentally together. She wondered, why doesn't God take me? This past week, God took her. 
all things in God's timing. When Ann and I had a young couples class, uh, a large group of people, there were any number of these young couples who wanted to have children and it wasn't happening. They struggled in God's waiting room. And again, we saw God provide over and over again, sometimes through adoption, sometimes through pregnancy. And then that singles group that I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> a lot of the young women and men in that group wanted to be married and weren't. I remember counseling with two young women, almost back to back. They were a couple days apart. The first young woman came and said, I really, really want to be married. And I've decided that I'm going to be really aggressive. I'm going to ask guys out. And the first person who asks me to marry him, I'm going to say yes. And then two days later, I talked with another woman from that same class. And she said, I'm really asking the Lord what he wants to change in me to make me ready to be married. Two very different attitudes about waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord is not necessarily being passive. It's trusting. That second woman was waiting upon the Lord and trusting that he would do what he needed to do in her life. To rejoice when nothing is happening to me is a mark of mature faith. At the conclusion of this book of struggle, the prophet says, though the fig tree should not blossom, though there be no fruit in the vine, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation, for God the Lord is my strength. The greatest experience in my life of being in God's waiting room started on June 3rd, 1977. Uh, our family was coming back from a state park in the middle of the afternoon, and we were hit by a drunken driver going 75 miles an hour in the 35 mile an hour zone. Ann was driving, she took the brunt of the impact, and she was in a coma for three weeks. I went with my mother-in-law and father-in-law every day to the hospital, and we would see the neurosurgeon and every day I would ask him the same question. Can you tell me about my wife's condition? And he would say the same thing. All I can tell you is the longer she's in a coma, the less likely she is to retain, regain meaningful neurological functioning. Uh, he was basically saying if she regains consciousness, she'll be a vegetable. I didn't believe it. Uh, I really had felt an assurance from God that she was going to be okay. But I wondered, why, Lord, why so long? Three weeks is a long time when somebody is in a coma. And finally, Anne regained consciousness and step by step uh, regained all of her abilities, or most of them anyhow. She would tell you that she's still struggling with <laughs> some of the deficits that happened as a result of that accident. But I was talking uh, sometime after that with a mom of one of the kids in my youth group. This mom, Margaret Fever was her name, was an amazingly spirit-led person. And she said, Dave, what you don't realize is that that coma was God's anesthesia. Ann had seven major operations in the first three days. Uh, fractured jaw, broken arms, uh, her leg was nearly amputated. I mean, so many surgeries, she would have been in excruciating pain if she had regained consciousness. But it was God's anesthesia. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will walk and not be weary. They will run and not faint. 
The sovereign Lord is our strength. If he's in control, I don't need to worry. If he's in control, I do not have to be anxious. When we truly learn how to wait on the Lord, we learn how to trust. Let's pray. Lord, your word says, have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We thank you for that promise of your peace, which passes understanding. We thank you, Lord, that even when we don't understand even when worry knocks at the door, we can trust you that you are working your purposes out and that you work all things together for good for those who love you, who are the called ones according to your purpose. Thank you, Lord, that you promised to never leave us or forsake us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing our closing hymn of commitment number 88, Abide With Me. Let's stand. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen.